Let's, let's go to verse 6. This is the second creative day. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. Now, there are many indications in the book of Genesis that in the original creation, there was a, a canopy. You know what a canopy is? When you, rich little girls in America have canopy beds. There's a covering over their bed. We call that a canopy in English. I don't know what you call it in Russian. But is it the same word? Wonderful. I'm, hey, I know another Russian word. Okay, so um, early in Genesis, there are indications that there was a canopy of water over the earth. There are one or two poetic references to this after the flood, but I don't think there are any practical objective references to it after the flood. One of the possibilities is that uh, one way the flood came was that that canopy dissipated. I know someone who actually wrote, who's an electrical engineer who wrote a doctor, uh, doctoral dissertation where he contended that that canopy of water also was connected to the long lives of people before the flood. We're going to see how these incredible, impossible today um, links of time that people lived before the flood. After the flood is over though, it drops. It drops way down. And by the time you get to the generation of Moses, Moses wrote Psalm 90. And in Psalm 90, he says the average age is 70 or 80 years, which is pretty low. Now, Moses lived a lot longer than that himself. But what he was saying was, you know, if you're pretty healthy and vigorous, you might live to be 80. Most people live to be about 70. And that's by the generation of Moses. So um, some people think that that canopy of water positively impacted the longevity of people on the earth, the, the number of years that they lived. But there's a separation of these waters on the second creative day. Um, and so you've got the water beneath and you've got the sky above. God made the expanse, verse 7, separated the waters which were below from the waters above, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven. There was evening and there was morning a second day. Verse 9. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And he saw that it was good. Then God said, Let earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit of their kind, with seed in them and on the earth, and it was so. So, remember there's tohu wabohu. There's no form. That's tohu. So what does God do on the first three days? He gives a form to things. He gives a shape to things. So, there's light. There's sky, there's earth. But on the second three creative days, he addresses bohu, the emptiness, the void. And he begins to fill everything. He, he, actually, this is also form. Um, the sun and the stars and, and, and the moon. But he, he localizes the light in the heavenly bodies. He fills that the sky is separated from the sea. We could also put the seas here. He fills the sky and the seas with birds and fish on the fifth day. He makes the earth on the third day. He fills the earth on the sixth day. We call this symmetry. In the 18th century, they wanted their rooms to be symmetrical. If you had a chair and a sofa on this side of the room, they wanted a chair and sofa on this side of the room for balance. When we say symmetry, we mean balance. So you see the balance here between the first three creative days and the second three creative days. Now there's not only balance, but there are two poles here. Um, mm, we go, but you've got to combine it. We go from the heavens, day one and day four, day two, and day 
five, at least with the birds, to the earth. Okay? So we're starting high and we're going down. And we're moving through Genesis 1. Um, I think it's when we talk about the fact that God is incomprehensible to us, His creative power is just as incomprehensible as His being. There's a very, very, very effective speaker in, in Atlanta, Georgia. His name is Louis Giglio. And he does one CD. He's speaking in Houston to a huge crowd of people. And he is talking about the stars, the magnitude of the stars, the number of the stars, and the size of the stars. And while he's, um, while he's doing that, he's preaching. And he's giving a devotion on Psalm 33. Look at Psalm 33. I want to tell you something that Louis Giglio says. Uh, it's a breathtaking um, verse. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of His mouth, all their host. Now, host is one English word that we use poetically to mean stars. I don't know what your Russian translation says, but in some of our versions would say, by the breath of His mouth, all the stars. And in this great, great message that He gives, and there are many graphics, and He shows the size of the biggest stars in comparison to the earth, in comparison to our star, the sun. And He calls God, it makes me emotional, he calls God the amazing star breather. That God breathes out the stars. Um, one thing that I want you to notice on the fourth day, beginning in verse 14, is such a tremendous verse. Um, He, um, he appoints the lights in the heaven to be signs for, for seasons and for days and for years. Um, just notice that little phrase at the end of verse 16. I'm sorry, it just makes me so emotional. He made the stars also. Think about that. Oh, by the way, He also made the stars. Like it's a little thing. But you know what? There are no big things for God. God doesn't say, oh, don't bother me because I'm, I'm working on a big project now. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get through this. No, 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 no. They're all the same size for God. They're all equally possible. They're all equally manageable. Because God is bigger than everything. See, we need to worship when we study this stuff. Now, someone asked me during the break, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in chapter 3, but I'll just mention it now. Um, Somebody asked me, well, why does one person believe the biblical account and why does one person reject it? And why does one person believe what God says and one, another person says there is no God? Well, that's got a lot to do with grace. Um, but I will say this. This is not a theology course. This is a, a course where we just study the words of, of the book of Genesis. But let me teach you the first principle of theology. This is Theology 101. This is what you have to know if you're ever going to learn to think theologically, and if you're ever going to understand 
the Christian revelation that we find in the Bible. Are you ready for this? God is God and you're not. God is God and I'm not. God is God and we're not. Now, I told you that these two most famous atheists in the world right now are the professor, retired professor at Oxford, Richard Dawkins, and the American writer, who's an Englishman who became an American, Christopher Hitchens. I tell you that Dawkins' great problem is that he cannot imagine God. And I tell you that Dawkins, uh, uh, Hitchens' great complaint is moral outrage. But let me just say that Christopher Hitchens' problem is not that there's no God. Christopher Hitchens' problem is that he's not God. And a lot of these men are angry because God gets to decide, but they don't get to decide. And they're angry because of the way God judges the world and people in the world, and they've got a problem with that. They don't have any problem with them judging God. They have a great problem with the Creator judging His creatures. They have no problem at all with the cre creatures judging the Creator. We have a saying in English, He's different not in degree but in kind. In other words, the difference is not just in the size. The difference is in the quality and the kind of thing. We say about Shakespeare, Shakespeare is a writer who's different not in degree but in kind. Shakespeare stands alone in English. He stands alone. We don't even know who's in second place. We only know who's in first place. Well, God is different from us not just in size, not just in degree, but in kind. God is God and we're not. He made us. We didn't make ourselves. And we dare not remake Him. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Okay, we're working our way through the six creative days in Genesis 1, and we've noted how in the first three days God gives form, and in the next creative, three creative days um, God gives fullness. Um, verse 20, God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters. You know, there are species which have not been cataloged yet. By the way, if you go to the British Museum and you have something to give to the museum, uh, not the British Museum, the British Library, and you have something to give to the library which they want, it will be cataloged in 11 years. That's how long it takes them because they have so many things that they're cataloging. Well, there are still things undiscovered in the world which have not been cataloged yet. They've not been named. And most of them are at the bottom of the sea. There was a president of Moody Bible Institute named Joe Stoll wonderful speaker. In 2005, I heard him speak in Hungary. And he was talking about a cruise that he just went on in Alaska. A cruise where you get on a ship and you sail around. And one day on the cruise, they listened to the humpback whales. And they had a lecturer. The lecturer was an evolutionist and talked about the millions of years that took these creatures to evolve. And 
Joe Stoll was not trying to make any point, but he said something, and after he said that, I couldn't think about anything else for 30 minutes. I didn't hear anything else he said for the next half hour. And I started crying. Here's what he said. Here's what the lecturer said. Every humpback whale in the world sings a song. You can go to your computer right now and Google humpback whales and you can listen to the song on your computer. Every humpback whale in the world sings a song. Every humpback whale in the world sings the same song. And the song changes 25% each year. So that by the fourth year, every humpback whale in the world is singing a different song. Now I have two questions. How long would it take that to develop in evolution? Three questions. How could it be an accident? And number three, who's the choir director? Who teaches all those whales the same one song? Now, God has shown us in creation that He's there. Do you know that no, not only are we in the only planet in the solar system that is, is habitable, that a human being could live on, but we're also in the only uh, planet on the solar system where scientific discoveries could be made because of our position in the solar system. Do you know that the key to scientific uh, discoveries is the presence of a moon? And that the key to scientific discoveries is the possibility of an eclipse? There's no other planet in our solar system which has this possibility. There's one partial eclipse possible in one of the planets. I think it's Saturn, but there's no total eclipse. You need a total eclipse to find out what the stars are. You need a total eclipse. You needed a total eclipse in 1919 to confirm Einstein's theory of rel relativity, which was confirmed experimentally through a total eclipse of the sun. Don't ask me to explain the science. I just know that it's true. So God has put us in a position not only where we can live, but where we can discover what He's done. And we can make progress in science. He wants us to do that. And He wants us to give glory to Him. The problem is not science. You know, one thing that happened as a result of that trial in 1925 when the Christians were so embarrassed is that some Christians decided we shouldn't study biology because it was dangerous. That's foolish. We should study everything. All truth is God's truth. But the key is to give glory to Him. So He made all the things that swim in the sea. And God blessed them, verse 22, and said, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and morning a fifth day. Verse 24, Then God brought forth the living creatures on the, on the earth, the cattle. Now, let's skip to verse 26.